Corinthians 15, no, 7, verses 15 to 20. And it says, For what I am doing, for what I am doing, I do not know. Okay, hold on. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that if it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. Thank you, Zach. I think you got the most tongue twister passage in the Bible there. Um, I apologize, Zach. If you haven't noticed yet, I'm not Terry, but you may have also noticed that our normal podium is missing. And there's a purpose and there's a reason for that because today we are going to have a lot of things happening on this stage. So I've asked a few teenagers to kind of help me with our illustration today. So if you are one of those teenagers, the seven with um, the t-shirts and Chris, if you can just come sit down here, that would be perfect. I think all of you are already here. Um, you may have noticed that there is an orange line up here on the stage. Well, you probably haven't because when you're sitting down, you can't see it. The baptistry is not under construction. This has to do with our class today. So we're going to be using this to illustrate a spiritual point as we have a discussion. So I want you to think about how many decisions that you have made today so far. When you think about it, it's a lot more than you probably realize. There's probably hundreds of decisions that you've made to get to the pew where you are this morning. The first one probably revol revolved around the snooze button on your alarm. Do I have time to sleep? The kids won't wake themselves up. Do I want breakfast? Do I want a shower? What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What route do I take to church? Is that light too yellow? <sighs> the age-old question in Arizona, is parking in the shade worth it? Because we're always on a hunt for the shade, but there's a price that comes with parking in the shade because the birds constantly find the shade as well. So do I have a hot vehicle or do I need to wash it? <laughs> then once you got here, the question was, who am I going to talk to? Who am I going to sit by? Some of you may be thinking, is there any coffee left in the foyer? Am I going to sit in the same spot that I always do? Or am I going to switch it up and sit somewhere else and maybe meet someone new? We make decision after decision after decision every single day. We make decisions about what we're going to wear, who we're going to talk to, what we believe, what we're going to eat, and the list goes on and on. There's actually a medical thing called decision fatigue. And what happens is you've made so many decisions in your day that you start to zone out on being able to make them. You emotionally shut down, you mentally shut down, and it can even be important decisions. And you might say, A or B, it doesn't matter. I just want this over with. Some of you may have experienced that shopping for a house or shopping for a car. There's so many choices when you really start looking. And you can get to the point where you don't care what color it is. You just want the process to be over. And we're constantly making choice after choice after choice. And then you come to church and you think, okay, I'm finally free of this. And then you have people like me who start asking you hypothetical questions. I love hypothetical questions. I think they're great. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but hypothetical questions always seem to involve trains, small children, pregnant women, and for some reason, dynamite. I don't know why that is, but all of them seem to revolve around these principles of extreme situations. Employers like using them now, too, in their interview process. They'll ask you things about office supplies and whether you're allowed to take them home or not because they want to know what your character is. 
They want to know what your thought process is, where your moral compass lies. And a lot of these hypothetical questions don't really have any bearing in reality whatsoever, do they? But I think that they have a place. The reason that I love hypothetical questions is because it's a way for us to explore our morality. It's a way for us to take the things that we find within the Bible and run them through a scenario of sorts to see how they hold up. To take the concepts, to take the commands, and see if we draw a line in the sand here. When we go to this extreme situation, will the purpose and the spirit behind that guidance in the Bible hold true? Or will it warp based on where we've drawn this line? We're constantly asking ourselves the question of, what is sin? What is right? What is wrong? How far is too far? We look at these concepts, and they come from a good place, don't they? We're asking these questions because we care. Because I think we want to be the kind of person that's described in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, but the solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good from evil. We are seeking to be mature people. We want to be that mature Christian because of the end goal, and the way that we get there is because we have practiced those things that we find within God's word. We have lived them out on a day-to-day basis, and the result is we can know what's right and what's wrong. We have the ability to see those things. That's the goal. That's where we want to be as Christians. But I have bad news for you. If you don't realize this already, even when we become mature, we can still fall victim to temptation. We can still fall victim to sin. And that's what that passage that Zach just read was all about. I'm going to draw your attention to a few verses in Romans chapter 7. Paul says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. He knows what he wants to do. He's not doing it. And he goes on and he says, but what I hate, that's what I find myself doing. The evil, the sinful, the things that hurt himself and the things that hurt God. But this is Paul talking. He goes on and he says it a few more times, a few different ways. He says, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. He says, for I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Paul has described what it's like to be a guy who wrote a ton of scripture to us, a guy who should be mature, a guy who should know good from evil. And yet Paul is stating in this passage that he too has failed. We are going to struggle with sin. We're going to make wrong choices. Sin has one of the greatest marketing departments that's ever been. If sin didn't look appealing, we wouldn't choose to do it, would we? We would walk away and there wouldn't be a temptation at all. But we see the things of the world and the way that the world talks about it, and we say, man, I might be missing out on something. And so what we do is we start thinking about that idea of that line that we draw on the sand between what's right and what's wrong. And we start asking ourselves, how close can I get to that thing that everybody says that I'm missing out on without hurting myself and without hurting God? And this is where our thinking breaks down and we set ourselves up for failure. Chris, would you come up on stage? Chris is going to be my beautiful assistant for the day. Chris is going to represent us, Chris the Christian. I thought that was pretty fitting myself. Um, So Chris is going to help us understand how we can do better at this process and what it looks like when we carry out this way of thinking. 
So what happens is we start thinking about sin as a line to be crossed, and we say to ourselves, okay, how close can I get to that and still walk with God? So Chris, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to walk up and down that line. This side, we're in the clear. On the other side of this, we've drawn a moral line that this is sinful. So as long as Chris doesn't step over here, he's good. So could you walk up and down that line for us a little bit, Chris? He's doing pretty good. It's not too difficult a task. So our thinking revolves around this way. Lying, would you join me on stage? I'd like lying to stand over here. The problem is when we start thinking about sin, we draw this line and we base it on principles like, well, what is lying? Lying is simply not telling the truth or telling an untruth is specifically usually how we define it. We don't think of it as telling an untruth if we're saying to ourselves, you know what, I'm just not sharing all the information. You know, it's not my fault they came to the wrong conclusion. I didn't tell them something that was untrue. It's not my fault that they jumped to a conclusion. Let me illustrate this from something in my life that I've done before. When I was 16, got my license, my first car was a minivan. <laughs> and me and some friends decided to go to a haunted house in the next town over. And we got lost. And we found ourselves on a dirt road. And at the end of this dirt road that we got lost on, there was this beautiful circular dirt area. And, well, we're, we're teenage boys. So the question is, can we do donuts? So we start attempting to do donuts in our front wheel drive minivan with the emergency brake. And we thought it was great. We thought we were successful. They were probably the saddest donuts anyone has ever seen. And then we drive on our way and we see a gas station and we pull in to ask for directions. And I notice as I'm pulling into this gas station that there is a police officer behind me. And I pull in. And I get out of my car, and he gets out of his car, and he immediately approaches me and says, Hey, we had a report from somebody that there was a white car. My car was white. At the end of this road over here doing donuts. And my response was, Well, I can't lie to him, so what do I do? And my question to the officer was, Does my car look like it can do donuts? And he looked at my front-wheel drive minivan and then proceeded to give us directions to the haunted house. <laughs> Not one of my proud moments. I deceived him. I lied to him. You can stop walking for a minute, Chris, sorry. <laughs> but that's how we approach sin. We start trying to see how close we can get to that line without crossing over. However, when we start flirting with this idea of getting close to this line, sin does not sit idly by, does it? When we get close to sin, it tries to reach out and grab us and drag us into temptation. It doesn't wait for us to wander over here until we're so deep in sin that it's fully taken us captive. It is active in seeking our destruction. So, lying, I'd like to point out these kids didn't pick these it's not what they struggle with. These are just names on the shirt. <laughs> lying, I would like you to do your best to drag Chris across that line. Chris, I want you to be a strong and mighty Christian who walks the line and refuses to be drug across. All right, go for it. All right, that's a good enough attempt for now. Let's continue with this. The problem is, we don't just fight one sin alone, do we? Gossip, would you join us on stage? We start with one, and then another kind of creeps in, and it's like they hold hands together and conspire. Like one sin leads us into another one. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus is talking about demons being cast out. And in verses 24 through 26, it says this, But when the unclean spirits go out of a man, it passes through waterless places, seeking rest, and does not find any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. 
And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and it takes seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and they live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. So we start out and we say, I can handle one sin, but then another one comes in. Evil spirits bring other evil spirits. Temptation brings other temptation. We start out struggling with lying, and then we start thinking about gossip, and we say things like, you know what? What is gossip? Let's draw this line. And we look at the definition and we say, you know, I really think that gossip is about talking about others behind their back. Specifically, I think it's about saying untrue things about them. And when we draw a line in that manner, it leaves us open to other trains of thought. And we say to ourselves, you know what? Uh, Billy over there, he's, he's really wrestling with sin. So I'm going to go and I'm going to talk to my friend. And I'm going to tell him all about that sin that he's wrestling with. And we're going to pray for him. Because that's what we need to be doing. And then we go to another person. And another person. And another person. Saying and airing someone else's dirty laundry and praying for them. Or maybe you find yourself where you have a friend who's really hurt you, who's done something despicable to you that's really hurt you, and you need a chance to vent. So you go to your friend and you tell them all about how this person did that horrible thing to you. Seeking advice, of course, on what you should do. And then... You go to another person, and to three, and to four, and to five, and to six. And at what point do you go and talk to that person? Same thing with the person we were praying for, isn't it? At what point do we stop and talk to the person and stop just talking bad about somebody? When do we seek to help and restore that person through more than just prayer? Sins? I want you two to work together. Chris, I want you to be a strong and mighty man in the Lord and resist as you walk this line of sin. <laughs> so you can see here, Chris is a pretty strong guy, right? The sins may not be his particular sin that tempts him, but guess what? There are a whole lot more sins in the world. Sin becomes sins. I would like to ask the rest of my sins to join me on stage. Maybe it's not gossip. Maybe it's not lying. Maybe it's not adultery. Maybe it's not addiction. Maybe it's not envy. Maybe it's not laziness and maybe it's not pride. But there is something that will pull against you very strongly when we choose to fight. And as long as we keep this mindset of a line not to be crossed, at some point, the story will play out like what we're about to see. Sin will have its way with us. Sin will take us as slaves and captives. Do you care to act this out? Sins? Do whatever you can't. Just be aware of the edge of the stage, please. That's, that's all that I ask. Chris, do your best. Walk the line. You still have to walk the line, Chris. And go. Chris has been taken down. Our Christianity has failed us. And the reason that it's failed us is because of the way that we're thinking. The way that we're approaching sin. And here's the key that I think will help us to make this situation look differently. It's found in 1 John. There's a typo up there. I apologize. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says this. This is the message that we have heard from him and we proclaim to you that God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. But if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in 
the light. We have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This passage is talking about a direction or a path. Chris, come back over here with me. When we stop thinking about sin as a line to be crossed and we start viewing it as the direction that we travel, it's like turning our back to the darkness of the night as the sun is rising and we find ourselves walking towards the light. Or as the sun is setting in the evening, we turn our back to the darkness and we chase that sunset as long as we can, trying to draw closer to God. We cannot approach sin as a line to be crossed. We must view it as a direction to be turned in our lives. We need to turn our back to lying. We need to not even give a hint of sexual immorality. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says a few things that are interesting that are trying to get this point across to us. He says, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, do not even look at a woman with lust in your heart. You have heard it said, do not murder. I say to you, do not even be angry with your brother. Jesus is not telling us a new place to draw a line in the sand. Jesus is talking about a mindset and a direction that we choose to live. Instead of looking at a line of this is where sin is, Jesus is telling us, Figure out what would please God the most. Start choosing not between right and wrong, but between what's good and best. When you make that the choice that you're making, you can't make a wrong choice. And as a result, our ability to resist temptation and to resist sin changes. Chris, you are no longer to walk that line. I want you to seek the Lord over here on this side of the stage. Wait, you can stay here for a second. Sorry. (laughs) Sin. You still have to try and drag him across. You still have to try and bring him over there. So we're going to let this unfold another time. You can cross the line. Okay. Chris, turn towards the Lord. Prepare yourself. Sin, do your best. Ready? Go. You cannot the mic. No, please don't. He's much more able to resist sin, isn't he? The reason that I set him up for failure one more time and not for success is because there's two more things that I want you to understand in this equation. When we change the way that we think, our ability to resist does increase. It does become greater. There's more that we're able to do, but there's two things that are critical for us to understand. We have an adversary that is actively trying to devour us. Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel at the beginning. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. First Peter describes the devil this way in chapter 5. It says, be alert. And of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. We do not struggle against the devil alone. We do not fight against sin on our own. We have God. We have Jesus who died on the cross. We have the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And we have the church. Mesa Youth Group, I would like all of you to come and stand on this side of the stage with Chris. 
Sin, stay over there. Go ahead and make your way down. When we start looking at the fact that we have the church on our side, there are passages we cannot help but look at and be excited about. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2, it says, Brethren, if any, if, I'm sorry, let me start over. Brethren, if even, even if anyone is caught in sin and any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore that one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We are to help one another when we are caught in sin or they are caught in sin gently. We are to help them. It says that we are to bear one another's burdens. And Galatians goes so far as to say that it is the law of Christ. That when we do that, we are fulfilling his purpose. You can't help but talk about James chapter 5. Starting in verse 13, it says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing songs of praise. Is any among you sick. Then he must call the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. And the last part of it in verse 16 is why we offer an invitation on Sunday mornings. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another, Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. We need to be talking to one another. We need to be telling each other about the things that we are wrestling with and the things that we are struggling with, and we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying because it brings healing, and because our prayers are of great effect, they can accomplish much. They are filled with power. So, Mesa Youth Group, you are not allowed to help Chris until he asks. Wait, Chris, you are to continue your path of running away. Stand right here, back to the line. Sin, you can go ahead and lay hold of him. What happens is we do not ask. We struggle and we fight alone. And we forget about the church. We forget about the power that is ahead of us. Chris, resist however you choose. When you feel like you want the help of the church, I want you to ask for it. Once again, my mob of helpers, try not to push anyone off the stage, but do whatever it takes for you to bring Chris to safety and to keep sin away. I'm going to move way over here. <laughs> All right, you may commence. Thank you all of my assistants. You may have a seat. You can all sit down. Thank you. I want you to look around this building. I want you to look at the person that's sitting next to you. I want you to look at the person behind you. I want you to look at the person on the other side of this auditorium. You are in the midst of the church. You are the church. I've done this illustration countless times for teenagers to illustrate this point. 
And it's always interesting to me to see how long a strong guy will wait before he asks for help. I have watched kids who are drug all the way further and further and further from that line until they cry out for help. Why aren't we asking for help? Why are we looking at this as a line and not a direction of our life? Why are we taking the best tools that God has given us to be holy, to be mature, and letting our pride get in the way? We want to think about it as a choice of right and wrong. That way of thinking is false. We need to start thinking about a choice between what's good and what is best. We need to be asking ourselves, what can I do that will be the most pleasing to God? I don't know where you're at in your walk with God, in your life, but I want you to know that you are surrounded by the church. I want you to know that you have brothers and sisters here that want to bear your burdens. You have brothers and sisters that want to pray mighty prayers on your behalf. And the last question that I want to leave you with is, will you use your life for good 